Uh, Mr. President, um, I want to address the budget resolution we're going to vote on later today. And to be clear, this is a device that makes it possible subsequently to pass this massive blowout spending bill that President Biden has proposed and to do it on a strictly party line vote. That's, that's what this is all about. And it's disappointing on many, many levels, well, not the least of which is that just 15 days ago, President Biden made an impassioned call for unity. He said, and I quote, this is an historic moment of crisis and challenge and unity is the path forward. Well, there's nothing about unity in this exercise. This is designed to be a partisan exercise. It is designed not to find common ground. It appears not to be informed by any objective measure of needs. And the only organizing principle in this bill that I can figure out is the desire to spend a massive amount of money on things that aren't required. Oh, and it's worse than that. It willfully ignores the adverse impact some of these policies are going to have. And part of what's so um, maddening about this is we've demonstrated, up until now anyway, that we can pass major bipartisan legislation. We've done it five times already, but no more. President Biden and the Democrats who control the Senate and the House don't want to pursue uh, bipartisan legislation anymore. I guess those days are behind us for now, according to them. But I would remind my colleagues of what a dramatic departure that is from what we've been doing about this COVID crisis. Back in March and April, when states shut down their economies and we went into a full-blown economic crisis, we responded with massive, bold legislation, the, the biggest of which, uh, the March bill, had a huge category that was designed and, in fact, did replace lost income for people who, through no fault of their own, were out of work. It had a huge category to deal with health care expenses for hospitals, for vaccine development, for uh, all kinds of PPP, all kinds of uh, PPE, I should say, all kinds of health care-related needs. And we had a set of provisions that were designed to provide liquidity, to provide loans and funding for businesses so that they could survive and people would have a place to go back to work after this was behind us. We did that. We really, actually, we did five bills altogether, every one of them, overwhelmingly bipartisan. In the Senate, each of the five got over 90 votes. The biggest of them didn't have a single no vote. My point is, we've demonstrated we can pass big, bold, unprecedented legislation if people on both sides of the aisle want to work together. We did it five times last year. But our Democratic colleagues don't want to pursue that anymore because they have a different objective in mind. By the way, the last of the five is the second largest of all time, a COVID relief package of almost a trillion dollars, and it was signed into law 39 days ago. And literally hundreds of billions of dollars of that money is still unspent. And yet we're told immediately we need an, yet another $1.9 trillion. This is unbelievable. And part of the reason it's so unbelievable is that the economy is not in the same place today that it was in back in March or April. Not even close. We were in, we were in a situation we'd never been in before. We'd shut down our economy. It was absolutely devastating, very, very scary. And fortunately, in part because of our response, I think, we were able to avoid a, a, a depression, a, an extended disastrous period, and we have begun a robust recovery. Consider some of the data, right? In April of last year, the unemployment rate hit almost 15%. Today, it's at 67 now, most economists didn't think we'd get below 7 until the end of this year, 2021. We got below 7 back in October. We have 18 states in the union that have unemployment rates below 5. After a devastating downdraft of our economy in the second quarter, the third quarter came roaring back. The third quarter, the economy grew by 33%. That was a long way towards recovering what we had lost in the second quarter, not complete. And the growth has continued. The fourth quarter grew by 4%. The 
CBO's economic outlook for this entire year is nearly 5%. We have a strong recovery that's underway. Now look, we're not there yet. We're not back to the tremendously booming economy we had just before the pandemic hit. But we do know that the vast majority of the economic pain that people are going through, it's concentrated in a handful of very hard hit industries. It's hospitality, travel, entertainment. We know that. So what we should be asking ourselves is, have we done what we need to do for these particular sectors and the people in these sectors who are hurting? But $1.9 trillion for the entire economy? I mean, think about this st statistic. Um, total employee composition, uh, co compensation in the second and third quarters of last year was down. Right? That's not surprising, right? Total employee comp compensation was down because so many people were out of work. It was down by about $215 billion. Government transfer payments to individuals was up by almost $900 billion. That's more than four times the lost income. And now we're told we need another whole round of these universal so-called stimulus checks, checks that go out to everyone regardless of whether you actually had any lost income. Well, it happens that personal income is actually higher today than it was before the pandemic hit. Disposable real per capita income rose last year at the fastest rate since 1984. Personal savings rate is at an all-time high for, for most of 2020, the highest since 1974 now. And that's all before the bill we passed 39 days ago that sends still more money to people. So I don't, I don't see the data that suggests we need yet another round of these universal stimulus checks. But in President Biden's bill that we're in the process of facilitating today, that is almost a half a trillion dollars we're gonna spend this way. This money's not lying on the shelf, by the way. We're either gonna print it or we're gonna borrow it from overseas. And President Biden has pretty much admitted this is really about fulfilling a campaign promise. And the fact is the vast majority of the 160 million Americans that have received checks already never had a, any lost income. They never lost their job. They never lost their check. What federal employee, for instance, of the many categories I could cite, what federal employee lost their paycheck because of the COVID crisis? I don't know of them. My staff continue to get paid throughout this entire period, but they all get checks. Think about this. If, Pre if President Biden's plan passes, as our Democratic colleagues want to pass it, and the eligibility criteria for these checks follows the, me the methodology from the previous two rounds of checks, then a family of four with household income of $150,000 will receive $5,600. That's on top of the $5,800 they got from the previous rounds. It's a total of $11,400 that we're going to mail out to a family that had six-figure income and no income loss. How does this make any sense? Consider the expanded unemployment benefits. Now, I was all in favor of, and I remain in favor, of expanding eligibility for unemployment benefits because we... We've got a lot of folks that work in the gig economy, they're, they're self-employed, and they have not been able to historically to participate in the unemployment insurance program. I'm in favor of having made those folks eligible, but we've already done that. They're totally eligible. On top of eligibility, back in March when we passed the CARES Act, we added $600 a week to unemployment checks just to do it. Well, it turns out that 70%, according to the University of Chicago, their analysis, about 70% of everybody who was unemployed ended up getting paid more money not to work than they get paid to work. In what universe does that make sense? We've had unemployment insurance for decades. Never, anywhere, at any time, under any circumstances, have we designed the program so that we'd pay you more not to work than you make working. And the reason we've never done that is because it doesn't make any sense. 
Now, President Biden's plan is not for $600, but it's $400 of extra payments above and beyond what unemployment insurance pays. And if that happens, then over half of all the beneficiaries will be paid more not to work than they'd get to than they'd get paid if they actually worked. And that will only slow the economic recovery as well as not make any sense. Not to mention the invitation of fraud. By the way, the it's estimated that there have been 10 billion dollars in fraudulent unemployment insurance payments in California alone. Speaking of California, state and local governments. Now this is rich. In this $1.9 trillion spending bonanza, there's $350 billion to go to state and local governments. Now we know our, many of our Democratic colleagues have wanted to bail out these fiscally irresponsible and insolvent states and municipalities for a long time. But here's what's unbelievable. <laughs> we're, we're told there's a fiscal crisis here. Just look at the numbers. The total of state and local tax collections in 2020 were up by $21 billion over 2019. Let me be clear about this. In 2019, the amount of revenue collected by state and local governments hit an all-time record high, 2019. In 2020, they broke the record. All-time record amount of revenue collected. This, by the way, does not include the $572 billion that the federal government sent to these state and local governments through the five bills that we've already passed. So they've got all-time record revenue on their own. We sent them $572 billion more and now we're told we've got to send them yet another $350 billion. Look, let's not kid ourselves. This is just a complete bailout of insolvent and irresponsible states. That's what this is. This hasn't got anything to do with a pandemic. Minimum wage, that's in this bill as well, the, uh, the president's proposal. Another terrible idea. $15 an hour minimum wage. What this is guaranteed to do is destroy the jobs of lower income people. And, and guess what? A disproportionate, uh, disproportionate number of them work in the hardest hit industries, like hotels and restaurants. This isn't just my speculation. The Congressional Budget Office projects that if we have a $15 mandatory minimum wage nationally, which is what this, the president's proposal would do, we'd lose at least 1.3 million jobs, maybe as high as 3.7 million jobs. And of course, this will disproportionately affect young people just entering the workforce. That's the biggest category of people who are paid at the low end of the pay scale. And so we'll just take away the ladder that these folks need to step onto in order to build the ability to provide for themselves and their families. We've got a, um, a moratorium on evictions from the CDC, which gets extended. This is this is unbelievable. First of all, it's absurd to think that the CDC has the authority to impose this universally in, in, throughout America. It, that They just don't. It's also a terrible precedent to say that despite the fact that our unemployment rate is below 7% and we have more than replaced lost income, people don't have to pay their rent. And let's, let's be honest about the consequence. There's only one consequence that's going to happen as a result of this and that is we are going to have less affordable housing and higher rents because a landlord is going to have to think long and hard about how long he's going to go without being able to collect rents in the future. And so he's either going to get out of the business, in which case there's less affordable housing being built, or he's going to raise the rents to cover that period when the government pursues this senseless policy. Now, health provisions is an area that is in a category unto itself here. And specifically, I think every single person in this body would agree that it's absolutely essential that we get as many vaccines into as many arms as quickly as we possibly can. That's certainly my view. I mean, that, for the sake of eliminating human suffering, to prevent unnecessary deaths and on a much lower level of importance, but also to help restore our the vibrancy of our economy, that's what we got to do. We've got to put as many vaccines into as many arms as quickly as we can. Well, today, there's around 260 million Americans are eligible 
to receive COVID-19 vaccines. We've got an average of about 1.3 million doses actually being administered every day. It's the highest daily rate of doses being administered anywhere in the world. And I'm trying to understand what more government spending now is going to do about that. With federal government, we already purchased 600 million doses, which is enough to vaccinate 300 million Americans. And we've got multiple vaccine candidates. Some have already been approved. Some are about to be approved. We've already paid for them. And we've also paid for all the other related costs of administering the vaccine. We, we paid for the R&D in the first place. We, we bought the production, as I say, 600 million doses. We, the federal government pays the transportation to deliver the vaccine to the site at which it's going to be administered. The federal government has paid for all the accompanying supplies, the syringes, the vials, the stoppers, the dry ice to keep it cold, all of that. Insurance, Medicare covers the cost of putting the vaccine into somebody's arm. We've even allocated money to uh, fund the planning of the uh, execution of this plan. It's pretty clear to me that in, in talking to Pennsylvania healthcare uh, folks who are on the front lines delivering this and, and, and actually vaccinating people, that the limiting factor now is production of the vaccine. And we're going all out. I mean, you could take General Motors and get them to produce ventilators. General Motors can manufacture ventilators pretty quickly. They can do that. You can't get General Motors to produce vaccines, not in anything like the time frame we would like. So I'm, I'm all ears. If someone can show me how we can spend money that will actually result in getting more people vaccinated more quickly, then I'm for it. I just haven't heard that explanation yet. And I haven't seen how it gets allocated in this bill to accomplish that. So Mr. President, um, President Biden had a commendable call to unity in his early addresses to the nation, but this exercise we're going through today is suggesting uh, that that kind of rings hollow. Just a few weeks into office and the president and our Democratic colleagues seem to be abandoning what had consistently been overwhelmingly bipartisan, successful, major responses to this COVID crisis. And now it seems that they are on a one-party partisan track to pass a bunch of their liberal wish list items, much of which has nothing to do with the circumstances we face. The fact is what we ought to be working on is maximizing the speed of vaccinations and ensuring that we return our economy, allow people to get back to work so that we can have the prosperity that we had before this pandemic struck. What we shouldn't be doing is using the pandemic as the excuse to pass a long-standing partisan policy wish list. I yield the floor.